everyone. Welcome back to Morning Cup. I am so honored today because I have Dr. Erica Mikowski with me, and she is an aggressive optimist and authenticity advocate. She is passionate about data, documentaries, dance parties, and dessert. Her signature Eat Cake for Breakfast bag references a lifestyle choice she is very committed to and an external reminder that she chooses to move through the world unapologetically as herself. A former competitive cheerleader and collegiate co cheerleading college coach, Erica loves glitter and enthusiast enthusiasm, encouraging everyone she meets. After exploring the unique intersection of authenticity, data, and encouraging the development of others, she founded Strategically Authentic, a consulting co company dedicated to helping individuals and teams leverage who they are and get where they want to be. Erica is known by clients and colleagues as one who believes even the most ambitious goals are possible, as long as they're planned rootedly in authenticity. She is ready to celebrate successes of every size along the way to achieving them. This wife and mother of two was once referenced as big bite of food. <laughs> it was intended to be a backhanded compliment, but the data doesn't lie. She is a big bite of food, and we'll get into that. So I hope you're hungry. Please help me welcome my friend, Dr. Erica Mikowski. Hello. How Hello. are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. I am so excited to dive into your journey. And I know we were chatting before, but you have done so much. You've accomplished so much. But I just, I really love the authenticity of who you are, but also your tagline and everything you've created. But how did you get here as like your journey? I would love to know. I'm sure everyone else would too. Um, the high level, you know, 5,000 foot view is I showed up and kept showing up and that's what life does to you sometimes. So I have a very nonlinear journey and I think most people really do. And even people who, so I have a daughter, we talked about this before. I have a daughter who's eight. She wants to be a vet when she grows up. I have no doubt in my mind that she will become a vet when she grows up. I, you know, I think parents who have kids, sometimes they're like, oh, my kid says this and next week it'll be this. No, I'm confident if we were to connect in 15 years, my daughter would be a vet. Now, even if you know at eight what you want to be, the journey is not linear. I, at eight, wanted to be 37 different things, none of which are what I am now because I don't think I knew this was a thing. I just kept showing up. I have an undergrad degree in child development. So I started as a preschool teacher, which is why my office looks like that of maybe a preschool teacher who just like held on to that. Um, and then my master's and my doctorate are in higher ed and adult learning theory. So I, from an education standpoint, was equipped to provide education and guidance to everyone from arrival to departure on the planet. I run the gamut of learning mm -hmm. and have had um, high ranking positions on campuses. I've run divisions and departments for nonprofits. I've done a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but I ended up here because life created an opportunity for me to reset a little. My significant other is younger than me. He finished his PhD and we moved to Colorado and I had the opportunity to restart my career <laughs> because uh, I was working in higher ed at the time and um, we live in Fort Collins. So Colorado State is here, but the opportunities for me um, being the partner of a, a postdoc were really great because postdocs don't usually stick around. So when we moved to Colorado, I got to take this stuff that I've been doing on the side for fun. I mean, who does professional development and strategic planning for fun? Me, I do. <laughs> so I got to take all these things that I've been doing for fun and say, okay, what would it look like if I decided this is the direction I'm going next? And I'll tell you, it was a lot of struggle, but I reflectively can say, I listened to all the things that I had loved across my professional life and even before that. And by choosing to do that, even the worst days and the most frustrating days have had a different kind of energy and momentum since I started doing this professional development consulting and strategic planning consulting full-time. And now between that and the keynotes that I give, I'm constantly busy, but with, with things that I love and am passionate about. So I have no complaints, uh, but there are a lot of tear-stained moments that came with getting to where I am. Absolutely. And where does your passion from authenticity come from? 
Oh man, because life is hard. <laughs> and when you try to do life as someone else, you're just choosing to make it harder. It, I've been passionate about authenticity for as long as I can remember. The idea of being myself. I mean, I loved Barbie longer than most people, which is where my Instagram handle comes from. And I still love Barbie. And I actually just picked up a collector Barbie from my childhood that's getting a new home in my office. I'm very excited. Um, but I... I look at Barbie and there's, so there's two different stories about how authenticity shows up for me and how this came to be. I look at Barbie. She went to space in pink glitter and nobody was like, Hey, you can't do that. So, you know, as much as I realize there are issues with Barbie as an icon for children, I'm again, I have a child of my background. Like I'm not here to make Barbie the poster child for all children. But what I can say is growing up with a love of an icon who said, this is who I am and this is how I want to show up. And I literally want to do everything and you can't stop me. It was a pretty powerful message to, to do everything and you can't stop me. And I'm going to do it as myself in loud pink glitter. Um, stuck with me mm-hmm. to my now almost, I'm, I'm a week away from 40 adjacent. So like we're very much we're th- late 38 is where I am. So mm-hmm. that piece. And then one day I was driving, we'd moved to Colorado I was driving my kids to Denver for a day at the Denver Aquarium and there were themes to the day because again, former preschool teacher, there was a theme to the day and outfits that coordinated and snacks that coordinated all these things. And I was talking to a friend as I was driving and she said, Erica, you are the best mom. And I said, I absolutely am not, but I am the Ericaist, and my kids know who I'm going to show up as. And that's markedly more important to me. And the car ride home that day, my kids fell asleep after a day at the aquarium. And I just started thinking about being your est self. So when you are your Caroline est, Mm -hmm. people know who's showing up. They know who's showing up to, you know, brunch or a volunteer meeting or a client meeting, whatever it is. When we live in our authentic space, we can get rid of things like imposter syndrome or reduce them because the more I know my invitations to the table, whether it is a, you know, an interview or a client meeting or whatever it is, or a keynote, I know I was invited as Erica because I'm very good at being Erica. In fact, I'm incredibly talented at being Erica. I am terrible at being diluted version of Erica, Mm -hmm. trying to mimic someone else, but I know my invitations come because of who I am. And the idea that we can help create a culture around that for entrepreneurs and for businesses and for teams and for companies helps manage employee engagement differently. If we can get rid of imposter syndrome in employees Mm -hmm. and we can bolster their confidence instead by creating a space where they get to show up as themselves, Mm -hmm. it changes the narrative and the culture. So little pieces all along the way, I've always Mm -hmm. contently been who I am. And I can look back and say the times when I tried on some other persona. I felt awkward the whole time. Like, I'm not cool. I joke about this a lot. I'm not cool, uh, but I'm awesome. I think you can, you can be awesome without being cool. Cool is a metric dictated by external Mm -hmm. guidelines and dictated by Twitter and Instagram and pop culture and things that if you miss a day, Mm -hmm. you fall behind. So chasing that carrot is overwhelming. So I just show up as myself and that that's okay. Um, not everybody wants this. Uh, and I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love that you said like the imposter syndrome, because a lot of people talk about that. Like I've talked about that too, where it's like when you're leveling up or in this space, but if you're really just leveling up and you're still yourself, you're just shifting some things or you're learning new information or you're growing, it's okay. But I, I love that you said that too, because I think it's just like standing your ground and owning who you are from the inside out and allowing yourself to be the best version of you and be authentically you. And I know that's your tagline, but that's also what you embody just from all the posts I've seen that you've done everything, just encountering you as well. It's just (laughs) being able to be you. And I think that's so, so key. And it's easier said than done for a lot of people that I've encountered where they don't feel safe to be themselves. What allowed you like growing up to just really be Erica? Um, I, I never questioned it. Uh, 
love it. I love I it. <laughs> I, I, that's a really great question. And I think the answer is yeah. I never questioned it. I never thought I wasn't supposed to be myself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even in the awkward teen stage, and I, I had a lot of tremendous influences in my life. Um, my, the best example I can give is my second grade teacher, who was also my first grade teacher. When I moved to second grade, she did too. And, um, I have been fiercely confident since arrival on this planet, I think. And in second grade by, by second grade, because it was my second year with Mrs. House, uh, I was ready to be her student teacher is really what happened. And she never made me feel like I wasn't allowed to exist as myself. And she figured out how to honor second grade Erica without squelching any of it. And there's magic in that creating space for kids. And I see that now having a a child going into third grade and child going into second grade, it is hard to create spaces for all these little humans who are trying to figure out all these pieces when you're also trying to have control and get things done. (laughs) So one of the greatest influences in my authenticity was Molly House, who I'm still friends with, who my children have read to on Zoom during a pandemic and have met and all these things. But she said, you as you are is exactly who I want to see. And she never stopped saying that. And that message is essentially the message that I give to my client base, the message that I gave at a keynote for 400 high school students two weeks ago. You know, it doesn't matter who's listening. Mm-hmm. creating this idea that you as you are is who I want is one of the most powerful things we can do. Yeah. I, I'm just like feeling all that because I, it's just so imperative that people hear that message. And I'm so glad you had such a profound teacher, which allowed you to really love teaching as well, or just being edu- ed- educating individuals, but really being able to be you. And I think more people, if we allow other people, give them the permission at such a young age, they don't question it. They don't worry about it. Like it's creating those spaces. And I think that is just so amazing that you had such a phenomenal teacher to really change your world as well of, or continuing to be in your world. And when people show up with ideas in your life, whether it is, uh, you know, an elementary schooler or a high schooler mm-hmm. or a colleague, how we respond to new ideas can change how they feel like they're allowed to show up yes. as themselves. What I mean by this is when I, so Mrs. House, great example, but across my life, even after Mrs. House, I had other teachers and, and even in my own household with my parents, Mm-hmm. When I had a random idea or a new thought, or I'm going to change career paths, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, you know, whatever it is, the people who saw me as me, mm-hmm. who wanted to empower my existence and my objectives, said they didn't say why. <laughs> they didn't ask me why I had this crazy idea. They said, How do we get there? right? They asked me to make a plan. And I think that's probably part of where my passion for strategic planning is. People said, okay, sounds great. Their initial response was, all right, (laughs) now what? Not in a critical way, not in a, oh, okay, now what kind of mindset, but in a, all right, now what? What do we do? How do we get there? How do we get there to whatever your next vision is? And from corporate CEOs to university presidents to you know, the person that you're volunteering on a local board with, big ideas that are given space to breathe Mm -hmm. have more power because sometimes the big idea is terrible, right? Like I've had plenty of terrible ideas in my life, but sometimes the big idea needs someone else to say, okay, Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's, that's part of what I've created for myself, but it's because along the way, everyone said, Mm -hmm. all right, so what does that look like? How do we get there? Oh, I love it. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of individuals that get stuck or told that their ideas are crazy or questioning them versus like giving them that space of like, okay, like, how do we do that? So with growing your business, like how has there been any roadblocks for you along the way? Sure. I'm a loud blonde female for starters. So like credibility doesn't really get thrown at me. Um, or at least in the beginning, didn't now, now it's different, right? Things are, things are different. And culturally we've shifted a lot, but I've been loud since the beginning. And, um, you know, part of 
the shift for me was I thought in the beginning, business looked a very specific way. Mm -hmm. So the biggest roadblock I had was trying to conform my existence from a business standpoint. So not necessarily my existence as a person, but conform what business meant and looked like Mm -hmm. to expectations instead of realizing that that's not a thing. Um, Because I didn't go to school for business. (laughs) So I didn't have any idea I was going to end up running my own business. And I tried to model things that I knew had been successful because of projects that I'd worked on or people that I'd seen and all that. And, And it took me a little while to get my own sense of okay, those are all examples of success and they're all really great, but how does Erica define success and where does that go? How do I get to that? And creating my own essentially strategic plan for myself um, without worrying if it was right, Mm -hmm. because that's not how business works. (laughs) So that was the biggest biggest hurdle was like letting go of doing it right. I mean, there are certain things that I definitely want to do right, like my taxes, (laughs) That is not up for creative interpretation. Hello, federal government and state government. I see you. I'm doing everything I can to follow all the rules. Um, I think I actually overpay because I'm so paranoid. Um, So (laughs) I'm afraid of the federal government. Um, But the number of things that have an actual right way to do them Mm -hmm. is a lot smaller than people realize. Mm-hmm. because we look at one example, but if there was one right way, there'd be one book and there are bookstores full of books. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you 50% of what I read in books doesn't apply to me and how I approach my stuff. That's, that's the thing is giving yourself permission to read a book or read an article or watch a, you know, a Ted talk or listen to a podcast, whatever it is to take resources and say, okay, that resource for that person, that circumstance, that advice makes complete sense. Yeah. How do I look at it through my own authentic lens and apply it in a way that fits me rather than trying to replicate someone else's experience because mine isn't the same. My heuristics are not the same. My existence is not the same. So trying to replicate instead of process and apply is the shift that a lot of people get stuck on is they're just trying to replicate the success of their people. And so what I've seen with, with clients in big teams, small teams, individual coaching clients, doesn't matter. I see folks who are stuck in replication instead of application mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Because I do think a lot of people in the beginning, especially if they don't have business background, like I didn't have business background, mind psychology, like they don't teach you anything about business (laughs) at all. But being able to take the resources, absorb the information, but then applying it in the way that you would apply it. So it's like that foundational piece to help you grow into what you want to build. But I think it goes back to like what you're saying is just being authentic to yourself of what works because you can try a million things from different people and it doesn't work because it's not like meant to be. And also it's going against like your natural instincts as well. And there's this cultural expectation of being aggressively competitive, right? Yeah. The the secret about authenticity is that it erases the need for competition because you can't compete with someone else and be authentic at the same time. It doesn't work. Right. So if you are competing in an authentic mindset, then you may be competing with yourself from yesterday, but mm-hmm. that's where the competition has to end because you know, you and I could be pursuing similar professional goals. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing them my way and you're doing them your way, then my opportunity is to cheer for your authentic pursuit of that. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that your authentic pursuit of that has nothing to do with my authentic pursuit of that. And that, you know, there's all these lists. So I told you I'm, I'm almost 39. So I will be spending a year joking about being 40 adjacent because we tell women that being 40 means certain things. And I think all of them are ridiculous. Um, It means you've been around the the sun 40 times. That's what it means. (laughs) Like that's, that's the extent of what it means. Yeah. Yeah. But we have all these messages, particularly targeted at women about accomplishments that are time bound and and all these things. And uh, before we moved to Colorado, we lived in St. Louis. And in St. Louis, the publication there has a 40 under 40 list. So you could spend your whole life trying to get noticed for 40 under 40. We moved to Fort Collins and the publication here has a 30 under 30 list. And we moved 
when I was 33. So if I had been, if that had been my metric, right? If my mm-hmm. success was defined by these external metrics, I, I moved in and made it impossible to be successful. I, I created an impossible cir- circumstance for me. So instead, and, and those lists are great and they honor people who've done incredible things and they highlight people who are doing great things. But if you look at that list and the competitive nature of being recognized in that way or in other ways, there are a myriad of other ways that people can get recognized. If it becomes about winning that recognition, mm-hmm. then you're competing in ways that are compromising your ability to exist as yourself. Yeah. Oh, that is so spot on. Just like even thinking about that too, because I think success looks so different for everyone. And you were saying that earlier too. This is just like kind of a refresher for people listening, but really understanding that define success on your own terms, because it can look very different from person to person. And it normally does, unless you are focused on what society thinks. But at the end of the day, it's what makes you happy and what's going to allow you to live your life to the fullest as well. Um, But I wanted to ask you, because I know some people might think that you're too much um, or been told you're too much, but what are your thoughts about that? And can you tell me the story about a big bite of food? Well, I was introducing you about that. So I was like, I got to dive into that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I am a lot. And if you want a lot, I cannot imagine a person who's more excited to come be a lot for you now. If that is not the dynamic that you need in this moment, I cannot minimize who I am and I refuse to minimize my existence. So if I consistently show up as a lot and someone, you know, hires me for a project and then asks me to tone it down, it's very easy for me to say, no, no, this is, you picked this, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is who I am. So when I was younger, early in my professional career, um, was very excited, enthusiastic about something that was happening in a person that I revered quite a lot that I was excited to be sort of collaborating with and um, who I looked at as sort of a mentor and role model to some degree said to me one day, sort of in the, I call it a verbal Cindy Lou Who. So, you know, in the original Grinch, when Cindy Lou Who gets patted on the head, she said, you know, Erica, you need to remember you're a big bite of food. And she said it in this way that was like a little bit I mean, it was supposed to be a backhanded compliment. That was the intent was to, to say a nice thing, right. With a smile, you're a big bite of food. Um, but in a way that made me feel small and less than, and it hit me hard. Um, and, and it was probably over a year, maybe even two before I let go of the hurt that that felt. And I looked at it and I was like, I know what her intent was, but the truth is I am a big bite of food. And what will happen when I lean into that instead of looking at that as Hmm. a compromising quality? So I'm a lot. I don't want to not be. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how to not be. Just ask my children when we're in public. I am very good at dance moves in the grocery store. And, um, you know, I know there are people who need exactly what I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't show up with that, someone might not get what they need. So I show up as a big bite of food covered in glitter and enthusiasm because some people have spent their whole life waiting for someone to be enthusiastic about their existence. And if they cross my path, I want them to know I'm on their team. Oh, I just felt that. It's so true though. You know, when you think about just where people need that extra oomph or that just really need that enthusiasm to really light that fire underneath them, to make those changes, to really level up to the, their potential, but being, having that cheerleader in their corner, that's going to motivate them to take that action. That's all internal because everything, as we know, it's all internal. We can hear everything, but really helping guiding them to that. So I would love to hear a success story you've had recently with whether it's any of any of your clients because I know you have a wide variety. <laughs> Whew, okay. Um sure. You know, I was working with a client who was in the process of moving from being a privately held company to publicly traded, applying to be publicly traded in the SEC application process. If you've ever looked at that is a monster. Like um it's a lot. And I was a contributor to that process for them. And part of the discussion around that application process and subsequent investor meetings and all those things. So 
for those who are not familiar with any of that process, you know, if if I say SEC and you think of college football, um, I hear you, I feel you. But for those who know, it's it's not something you can do half heartedly. <laughs> you have to care about what you're doing. And when you're frustrated, being a person who can say, why are we doing this? Why do we care? Right. When you hit a wall, being able to say to someone, okay, I can tell we're frustrated. Why do we care? Let's go back. Let's step back three steps and say, what was the original driving impetus for this decision to become publicly traded? Why did that matter? Um, usually, obviously there's financial implications, but there are other reasons to, to do that because then there are regulations that you're willing to take on for certain reasons, all this stuff. So getting that process completed and then being approved by the SEC, helping a client be approved to be publicly traded. And that is a years long, pro I mean, this is not a process that takes two weeks. This is not, this is something you have to have continued passion for and enthusiasm about. So talking about the plan and the pieces and what do we do and how do we hit the ground running because we feel confident this is going to happen and how do you retain optimism with undertones of practical reality and, and those things and when dates move and time, you know, time targets move and all this, being part of that continued momentum for something that some companies never do, um, either because they don't pursue it because they're afraid or because they don't know how to move through that process, or they try to move through that process and they can't do it with the level that the SEC is looking for. Being a part of that collective experience um, and sitting on the other side of that mm -hmm. is, a, is to me a huge success story because I did it in you know red lipstick and glitter. <laughs> and that's what it's about. <laughs> being for me, it is. It. Yes. No, but that's what I'm saying. It's like being you and helping yeah. them through that process because I, I've never personally done it, but I've heard, like, I know people that have, and it is exhausting, it sounds like, but being able to keep that going as well is really imperative to know that there's an end date <laughs> in <Yeah>. sight. <laughs> um, but with that being said, what are two to three tips you could let us know when you're starting your entrepreneurial journey that could wish you wish you would have known in the beginning? I So one of my favorite things to do with all sorts of populations is ask them to intentionally spend energy defining success. I wish someone had asked me to do that. I wish someone had used the approach that I use with other people. I wish I could have sat down with my own self, um, you know, in time travel. But the idea that you are allowed to define success for yourself, hmm. like, let's start there. You can do that. You can decide what success looks like. And for some people, success looks like turning off their email at 5 p.m. on Friday and not touching it again until 8 a.m. on Monday morning. That metric of success is gonna be different than someone who wants to be constantly on, on call. And, and you can make plenty of money in either category. You just have to know how to do that. So creating a sense of success and there's two parts, right? So you are allowed to define it mm -hmm. and you are a whole person. So your definition of success can't be professional only and forget that you have a personal life. Part of my personal definition of success involves the fact that this afternoon I'm taking my kids to the pool and no one will be able to reach me. And that will be okay. And the world will continue to turn. So for me, I don't want constant touch points and, and 24 hour availability. I put my phone in sleep mode when I go to bed um, and I use the sleep mode that has certain priority people. So there are certain people that are allowed to break through sleep mode, but there are very many of them and none of them are clients right? because there are not 2 a.m. emergencies for me in my definition of success. And if someone wants to live that life, then I am not the right person for them. So that leads to my second thing. So my first thing would be, you're allowed to define success and you need to do it as a whole human who has a whole life, not just a professional life. Number two, it's okay to notice if you're a wrong fit and not try to make yourself fit in a space that doesn't work. All that does is become emotionally draining and exhausting and it forces you out of your authenticity in most instances. So if you're truly invested in the idea that showing up as yourself is what the world needs and showing up as yourself is how you can be most successful, also it's how life is easier because you're not adding multiple filters of how does this person do this and how does this person do this and you know that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, if you're invested in existing authentically, you also need to be aware mm -hmm. that some projects are not a fit. Early on in my career, I had someone say, never turn down a project, you can find a way. And 
it was another person that I respect tremendously, but I think that was terrible advice Mm -hmm. because I I have turned down projects and I pass them on to other people who are either going to be passionate or have a different bandwidth or want to be a more reserved version of professional development. So they do similar work to me and they may design professional development curriculum for, you know, I work with HR departments a lot and we look at curriculum models for professional development. How do we support people across more than just a one-off encounter. Mm -hmm. And there are other people who do similar things and they want to show up differently as themselves. And that may be a better fit. So being aware of other people who do the work that you do Mm -hmm. and saying no to things that aren't a fit so that you can support someone else, right? There's this ability to encourage and support other people. That's great. And you're not trying to reinvent yourself every time you show up to a call or a meeting because you've taken on projects where you aren't a fit. Mm -hmm. That's really good words of wisdom. And I I do think a lot of people, especially in the beginning, will take on more projects. One, if it's financial reasons or two, it's just like, well, I can make it work. But I think it just rings true to the fact that if you are not a fit, it's okay. It's, It's not saying anything about you. It's just not the right content or the right Um, platform or the right program or whatever it is that's for you. And that's okay. But I I love that you highlighted that too, because I think it's important because you hear advice from all different types of people, but it it goes back to what makes sense for you internally, because that is going to show up in so many different ways if we don't negate it from the beginning. And the best day feels better when you did it as yourself, right? (laughs) The best day as a version of someone else will never feel truly fulfilling. It, it won't. And I give a keynote on the neuroscience of satisfaction. So I can tell you all the research that tells me I'm right. It's not just me saying nice things and it's sounding great to say, be yourself. It's me saying there's a ton of data yeah. that tells you fulfillment and satisfaction can't come from mediocrity. And when you are choosing to be a version of someone else, at best, you're still a version of someone else, right? The mm-hmm. best knockoff yeah. is still oh, not <laughs> spot on uh erica i've been loving this conversation so much um you are such a wealth of knowledge and just i love your personality your energy and i feel like i could ask you a million more questions but we're going to jump into the rapid fire questions if you're ready yeah. for them i am okay <laughs> first question is who is your hero my dad mm. why your dad who also was <laughs> authentic to the nth degree my dad um <laughs> was killed when I was 21 years old. And because of his authenticity, we had to have multiple overflow rooms at a church for his funeral. He was a person that impacted everyone and made everyone feel like they mattered. And not just because it was convenient, because they mattered, right? I think that there's a huge difference between convenience-based acknowledgement of other people and choosing to acknowledge other people in real personal ways. And my dad, I got to live with the greatest example of authenticity I could have ever imagined. And he is a huge reason that I show up as myself. He showed up a lot of places wearing whatever he wanted because that's what he did. And he didn't really care about those things and he didn't wear glitter, but I think he would be truly proud that I show up as myself um, in those same ways. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so sorry about your father. Thanks. What motivates you to work smarter? Uh, I like hanging out with my kids and my husband is amazing. So if I'm smarter with my work day, I get to spend time being with my kids. Mm -hmm. And then when my husband gets home, we get to spend time being as a family. And then when they go to bed, I get to spend time with my husband as a human instead of a human who's holding a laptop trying to get caught up. So we spend a lot of time. I joke that every night is date night in our house because once the kids are in bed, we choose to be present with each other. Again, my definition of success puts as much priority, probably more priority in my marriage than it does my professional accomplishments because Dan's my person and we've been through a lot together. And that the ability to sustain some of the trauma and challenges that we have faced that some people will never face is because we choose each other. And if I worked in such a way that I had to choose work all the time, I wouldn't have the marriage that I'm so proud to have. Mm, I love that. That's really important to remember too, because relationships are so key in our lives. So key. Yeah. My best day, you know, when I, when I have people talk about success, I talk about what are your best days? What happens on your best day? My best day can't happen without Dan. For me, it can't. 
So. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to can kind of reevaluate their lives if they're wanting more of that relationship. Because again, success, it looks for, different for everybody, but being able to just kind of take a step back and look at where your time's going, if it makes sense. Yeah. And it, I spend a, my career cheering for other people. So yeah. I love it. And I love encouraging other people, but he's the greatest encourager that I have in my own life. So being able to to honor and, and keep that going, you know, I'm whole without Dan. It isn't that mm-hmm. I am completed with Dan, but I am, we are better together. And he is a molecular virologist. So when I do my work um, in neuroscience research, so I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do neuroscience research. I talk about human evolution. I talk about a lot of really nerdy science focused things. And I get to spend my downtime with a person who is an expert and who's brilliant and who doesn't make me feel less than when I have a question. So working smarter is getting all the other stuff out of the way during the day. So at the end of the day, we can watch a nerdy documentary or I can say, Hey, I had this thought about mitochondria. Does this make sense to you? And it works. So part of working smarter is taking advantage of your resources. And I live with one of the smartest people I know. And also he's really fun to hang out with. So it's great. (laughs) It's perfect. It's a (laughs) win-win. It is. (laughs) So if you were a superhero, what would be your powers or power? My power would be creating, I would be, I, this is a weird example or weird way to describe it, but I would be able to become a mirror for other people of their capacity. So you would be able to see me and see what you are capable of that you have not given yourself permission to believe is possible. Mm, I love that. I have not heard that one. That's a, that's a good one. (laughs) So if you were to share a meal with four individuals living or dead, who would they be? Okay. Um, my dad, because I didn't get enough time with him. So my dad would definitely get to come. And then the, so the problem is my answer changes every time I read an interesting book. Um, Daniel Kahneman is a behavioral economist who I think is brilliant and fascinating. And I love his work. So probably I would want him to come because I love his work so much. And I love, um, how, how capable he is of taking things that seem overwhelming and converting them into digestible pieces, because that's what I pride myself into. So I feel like we would have a lot in common. Um, I think Tim Gunn is one of the greatest humans to ever walk the planet because he sits with people when they are struggling and helps them believe that they're capable of things and they're under crazy stress and all these things. So um, I would probably invite Tim Gunn and then, and then I would bring Dan because he's so great. And I can't imagine having a dinner. I mean, the other people can change, but I would always pick Dan because the opportunity to continue that conversation with a person who knows me so well and say, oh my gosh, can you believe this happened? Or, oh my gosh, now we can look at this. I, you know, Dan's the person I would pick to, you know, go stare at paint with. So I would pick him for my, my imaginary cocktail party or brunch or whatever else also. Well, I'm glad you're going to have him there because I feel like sharing that experience would be so powerful for both of you. Yeah. <laughs> what is the most daring thing you've ever done? Oh, showing up as myself when the world tells me not to. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I genuinely am unapologetic about my existence. And I have a quote on my computer that is from Gretchen Rubin, who I love. She wrote um, The Happiness Project. She's done a lot of things. She's really great. Um, but The Happiness Project is what most people know her for. But in that book, she says, enthusiasm is a form of social courage. And so mm-hmm. I... I mean, I, I was listening to it in an audiobook. I paused it there and just sat with that thought for a really long time because I think it is incredibly courageous and brave to say, this is who I am, period. Not this is who I am, is that okay with you? So mm-hmm. I think the, the most courageous thing that I have ever done is continue showing up as myself and being okay when it doesn't work mm-hmm. and being okay when at the end of the day, while I'm brushing my teeth, I think, oh, there are some choices I would make differently now that I've moved through that entire experience and being okay with myself, even though the narrative is that as a female who is in my late thirties, I should have all these things that I'm not okay with. Um, I'm great with myself. And I think that's pretty darn bold. Yes. I would definitely attest to that. (laughs) What is the phone app that you use the most? Um, oh, my calendar, but like, does that count? (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yes, because I often don't even know what day it is, but my calendar tells me where I need to be and what time. So the day doesn't matter as much. Um, during the school year, as long as I get my kids to school and we have, you know, we have sneakers if it's gym day or whatever. But like 
my calendar makes sure that I don't miss things. So that is the app I use the most for sure. I, I believe it. It keeps you strategic <laughs> for your day. Also, it tells me when I should log in for like flights too. <laughs> so <laughs> it really is. It's like my own personal assistant, only it doesn't um, respond when I ask it to do things. <laughs> It just keeps you organized. It just <laughs> good keeps enough. Good enough. Being late or not aware. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I know you mentioned a few books, but what is the last book that you've read? Um, you the I don't know. I'm listening right now to one by Jenny Lawson, and I was laughing so hard I was crying. She's amazing and brilliant, and talks about mental health in a way that's really approachable mm. and honest. Um, she has major mental health struggles and challenges, and she doesn't try to pretend. Um, so Jenny Lawson's, the book that I'm reading right now is called Broken in the Best Way Possible. And I truly was laughing so hard I was crying while I was listening to this book when I was at the pool the other day with my kids. So it's my current read. Does that count? Am I allowed to cheat? I basically just rewrote your question to what are you currently reading? You know what? Um, I always leave <laughs> it up to the guests on this one. These. <laughs> Listeners, I, it's not that I'm trying to cheat. It is that I... <laughs> can't even pick a favorite food besides ice cream or salad because the if you pick ice cream or salad, then you have so many choices with it. So the idea <laughs> of narrowing down choices gives me a little bit of anxiety. So my current book is that, is Jenny Lawson's um, Unbro or Broken in the Best Possible Way. And if you need some insight into mental health, that is really honest. And also the most random collection of stories written in a sort of stream of consciousness way, you know, in a, yeah. I say that positively, I, you listening to it, it just feels like someone's taking you on the most random journey, but you're, you're, you're in for it. You're ready. You're good. I think that's a really good read. I, I definitely want to add it to my list just because like, I know we talk a lot about mental health on here, but it's just so important to recognize it and have it something that's digestible for people too. Yeah, it's because great. I'm a huge awareness and just advocate for it. But, um, so if you were to have a movie about your life thus far, who would play you? Kristen Bell, but not Kristen Bell from Frozen. Although, whatever, <laughs> she has a great singing voice and I have a vocal performance minor and I would love to think that I would have songs in a movie about my life um, that I would get to awesome. randomly sing because that's how I live my life. Yeah. But if you have seen the show, The Good Place, she has like the perfect yeah. <laughs> timing and like just a hint of snark. And actually on that show, she has a ton of snark, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that version of Kristen Bell would be who I would be delighted to have represent my existence. Oh, I, I could see that. There's a lot of resemblance <laughs> personality wise. Not that I know her personally. But and she really <laughs> loves her husband. So like that in real life, she and Dax Shepard have this fantastic, honest marriage where when things are hard, they talk about it and you know, whatever. So I think that there's some natural connection there to say this relationship matters a lot to me. Absolutely. No, I think that's perfect. And what, I know you talked about salad and ice cream, but do you have a favorite family recipe that you like to make together or traditional that you guys make? Uh, we, we like to eat at my house. I'm from the Midwest. So a lot of things just go in a casserole dish for 45 <laughs> minutes to an hour at 3.50. Um, my children will tell you, I think my favorite recipes now as a parent are the ones that my kids pick. So mm -hmm. my favorite recipes growing up may be different, but now I will tell you that we make Texas sheet cake mm -hmm. and it is a very rich chocolate cake that you make in a jelly roll pan. So that, which is an 11 by 18. So it's a big thin because it's so rich that you can't eat like, massive pieces. Um, although my husband would tell you, you can, uh, <laughs> but this is my daughter's favorite dessert and it is their favorite way to show love to other people so when someone is coming to our house the question is when can we make texas sheet cake so that is probably my favorite recipe because it isn't just food and my yeah. kids have already started to recognize that the way we show love looks so different than just i love you or a hug it can look lots of different ways and those tangible connections to taking care of other people you know, human nature is to care about other people, even though, you know, we get all these messages about being fiercely independent and all that stuff. We are evolutionarily wired to take care of each other. That's science. So, and I know we're not here to talk about that, but it's the real science. No, I love it. I love it. it. So, so Texas sheet cake is probably my favorite because it is my children's love language. Mm, that's beautiful. I love hearing stories. In our house. So if you want to come visit my house and have Texas sheet cake, just let me know. Um, well, I'm not far. I'm in Denver. Okay, <laughs> come on up. I'm going to send 
insane. And even um, we have learned how to do it gluten-free. So I haven't tried the dairy-free version yet, but I can make it gluten-free and it's still pretty darn good. So I have worked on showing love to as many people as I can, because that's what my kids want to do. And I want to support their desire to show other people love for sure. Absolutely. (laughs) And if you were to describe yourself as an animal personality style type, what animal would you be? Um, Oh my gosh. (laughs) What's the most frenetic animal we can think of? Um, I, I'm, I would say I'm like organized chaos. There's this animal. I don't even know what it's called, but I saw it at a zoo once. This is how good, this is going to be really good. Buckle up, Caroline. So (laughs) there's this animal that has spots and stripes. It's a, it's a cat. It's part of the cat family, but it has spots and stripes. And I feel like that is, you know, it's an animal that shows up in the wild and is like, oh, animals are either supposed to have one or the other. I'm going to have both because that's who I am as an animal. So I think that that feels really like a good fit um, for this moment. Also, any high-pitched bird is probably appropriate as well. So take a loud, elaborate bird. I could probably be one of those um, because most birds show up unapologetically as themselves. So, so, but the kinds that don't like fight. I don't know if there are birds that don't fight, but are loud and colorful. Listeners, if you know a lot about birds, come find me and tell me what bird I am. Um, So yes, a loud, vibrant bird or this animal that is a big cat that has spots and stripes, whatever animal that is that I cannot think of. I know. I know what you're talking about, but I have no idea what it's called. But if you know, comment below. It's so random. Nobody would know it anyway. And I said it and everyone would be like, what animal is that? Now you know that there's this animal that has spots and stripes, but none of us know the name. Well, eventually it'll come to us. It'll come to us later. Um, sure. So I know you kind of already touched on it, but if you have a day off completely from your clients, what, how's your favorite or what's your favorite way to spend that day? Oh, I walk the dog and listen to an audiobook for sure. Preferably if it's an, if it's a non-work day, I, I love audiobooks. That's how I get in a lot of my research is walking the dog, listening to audiobooks. But on a non-work day, I would prefer to be lighthearted and funny. So I have a lot of authors that fall into that category. Bill Bryson is another, Jenny Lawson, Bill Bryson is another one um, that I just laugh. I like laughing. I would spend my whole day laughing um, and feeling all the feelings and probably happy crying, which I already, before we recorded, I told you I was happy crying this morning. Um, I love a good happy cry. I love a day full of laughter. I love being exhausted at the end of the day, but not drained. Mm -hmm. So that's my difference. I would be exhausted and I would fall into bed exhausted from a day full of every version of joyful existence that was possible. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a perfect day. (laughs) And what's something an outsider wouldn't know about your industry? Oh, that, that it is more valid than people give it credit for. I think (laughs) Um, I think people look at professional development as fluffy malarkey, right? Those are technical terms, fluffy malarkey. And meaningful professional development, intentional professional development that is rooted in needs assessment and true empowerment of employees and the opportunity to help them step into spaces they didn't think they were capable of and all this piece is true, intentional, well-designed professional development Mm -hmm. is absolutely powerful. But the vast majority of what is out there at labeled as professional development is respectfully a waste of time. (laughs) So I think that's part of it is, is there's a lot of fluffy malarkey out there. So the people who think that are probably right. They've run into that professional development without continued application doesn't really serve a purpose. So that is part of what I'm so passionate about when I work with teams and companies is, okay, so you want to have me come in for a day. Great. I'm ready to come in for a day. I will wear glitter. What glitter color do you prefer? Like I will ask all these questions. Um, And how do we give the time that I spent there continued impact? Because if we're not doing that second piece, professional development, is mostly just a frustrating waste of time to the people who participate. And then it becomes a waste of resources. And then we create this experience where everyone hates professional development. I can completely understand why people hate professional development. And when they see me on their calendar and they've not encountered me yet, that may increase their frustration out of the gate. Oh, I have this mandatory professional development thing I have to go to. But if it's me and I've worked with the people in their corner, to do a meaningful needs assessment, and we are going to give it purpose and we are going to give it 
momentum and we're going to give it purpose in six weeks and in four months instead of just purpose for this moment because we want to check it off the box. You know, we want to check the box and say, oh, we did professional development for Q2. Like, here we go. Um, professional development with purpose can be one of the most powerful ways to change an organizational culture. I that was a super that. long answer. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It, it goes with the flow here. <laughs> There's no right or wrong way here. Perfect. Um, Great. But I have one final question before I let you go. Where can people find you, hire you? Oh. We'll link everything below. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, my website. So I love humans and I love our need for efficiency. So my company is called Strategically Authentic, but I knew no one would type that in a search bar. So you can find me at stratauth, www.stratauth.com. That's my website. You can see a little bit about what I'm up to, the keynotes that I give, the work that I do. Um, the most fun place to find me is on Instagram. So my Instagram handle is at consultant barbie. And I share tons of free work. You know, I, I love the idea that what I have is useful to someone else and I will put it out on social media and it will make me zero dollars and that happens and that's okay. So mm -hmm. I love helping people think about ideas in new ways and I show up consistently and authentically there in that space. And if you have enjoyed this energy, you can get a whole lot more of it there on Instagram. So those are the best places to find me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, you know, but those are probably the two best places to find me. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for coming on today, sharing your story, your journey, all the wisdom that you did. I'm so glad that I got a chance to listen because I always learn something new from everybody. But thank you again for coming on and just sharing. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, make sure to like, subscribe, comment below. What was the biggest takeaway from Dr. Erica? I'm sure she would love to see. I know I always love seeing those comments, um, but make sure to do that and we'll see you on the next video.